I would like to introduce you now to Ken Weizma. Ken Weizma is the founder of the Justice Conference. He's pastor of the Antioch Church in Bend, Oregon. And he's here with us today. I will open the Justice Conference with a prayer in a moment. Ken, can I invite you to the stage, please? Great to have you here. Was I going to pray? <clears throat> I, uh, I have a Dutch last name, but I don't speak Dutch. So um, if I could, I'd like to open us in a word of prayer. And I'm going to read this. This is a prayer that was written and prayed over the very first Justice Conference, uh, February 10th of 2011. And so if we can, let's pray. Father God, lead us to hear the cry of the vulnerable and the oppressed. Lead us to care for the weak and needy, and lead us to see others as brothers and sisters. Help us appreciate goodness, love simply, and not hide hypocrisy with rhetoric. Let us embrace justice and mercy. Grant us humility. Supply us with enough faith to give our lives away, and bless us with strength when we grow weary. Lord, let the knowledge of your love Fuel our commitment, inform our passions, stir our gratitude, and help us transform the world for you and your glory. Amen. Thank you. Ken Weitzma is oprichter van de Internationale Justice Conference, gestart in Chicago. Door middel van training en coaching daagt hij bedrijven uit om fair te worden. Ook doseert hij filosofie en recht aan Kilns College in Oregon. Ken gelooft dat recht doen alles te maken heeft met Gods ideeën over menselijke relaties en de waarde van het leven. Hij hoopt dat we met de Justice Conference vooral elkaar inspireren om gerechtigheid te brengen. Ken leidt deze dag in met uitleg op de vraag waarom de Justice Conference. Well, good morning. Uh, that introduction was was uh, all in Dutch, so it, it could have said some really embarrassing things about me, and I wouldn't know it. Um, but I want to tell you a quick story, and the story is simply this. I'm a pastor, first and foremost. Uh, I love people. Uh, I love the idea of the local church and what people coming together can do to encourage, to love, and, and show God to each other. And the church that I, I am blessed to be a pastor of in Bend, Oregon, Oregon, above California, uh, up uh, in the states there, the land of Donald Trump. Um, and uh, in 2010, a group of us came together and had a vision for doing a conference. We believe that justice isn't just a good thing that some people can do or a department of a church, missions department can do or a few radical people with dreadlocks can do, but justice is a necessary thing that, that involves all of us. And so we wanted to bring together a conference to have a conversation around this important thing called justice. And so we dreamed of how we could use our creative talents and kind of pull this thing together. And so in 2011, we had the first justice conference. And since then... Uh, without realizing what would happen, there have been 14 conferences over five countries and about 30,000 people like you who have sat and given a whole day to talk about justice, which is a fascinating thing because if you really think about it, justice is about giving your life away. It's a, it's a really foolish thing. To, to come somewhere, not to learn how to invest or how to make more money, but to learn how to be generous and to give your life away. And so today, when we're sitting here together, we're, we're getting to think through uh, and wrestle with how we're going to be foolish together. So I feel like I'm in good company. Um, we're going to be fools for Christ. And so this justice conference that we've begun, uh, that has kind of gone, the, the craziest part about that. Uh, is that it's taught me two things. One, that when Jesus says, with a little bit of faith you can move mountains, that what he didn't mean is that you could, like Harry Potter, take a wand and look at a mountain. You guys don't have mountains here. Uh, so you'll have to imagine with me what a mountain might look like. And, 
And it's not like Harry Potter, you take a wand and you look at the mountain and you say a magic word and you, you pick the mountain up and the mountain is levitating in the air as you move it over uh, the, the house of your enemy and then drop it. Um, it. It's not like that. See, Jesus said these words when he had cursed a fruit tree that wasn't bearing fruit. You see the, the metaphor there. Something who by its very nature should bring forth something good and it wasn't doing what it ought to do. And Jesus curses the tree and comes back the next day, not the same day, the next day as they're coming and, and the disciples see that this tree is now reflecting on the outside what was true on the inside and, and it is shriveled up and died and they ask about this and Jesus says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, then you can move mountains. And what I think Jesus meant was, if you get together with a group of other Christians and you dream really big dreams so that you can make a difference in the world for Christ, and you pray and say, not in our strength, God, but in the strength that you supply, that when you come back a year later or five years later, you look and somehow the landscape has changed. That's what it means to move mountains. And I'm incredibly blessed to sit back and, and not be involved really in any way, but to see that what God begins, he carries forward in his own strength, his own power as he makes a difference. That was the first thing that I was able to learn and was a real blessing. The second thing is this, we wanted to pull this conference together and talk about a theology of justice. We didn't say we're going to come together and talk about trafficking, or we're going to come together and figure out how to end world hunger, or we're going to come together and we're going to talk about any number of the sometimes sexy justice issues uh, or the more urgent justice issues. We said the first thing we're going to do is, is talk about a theology of justice. And for us, that was kind of a really cool phrase. Uh, I tried to write a book and call it Theology of Justice, and the publisher wouldn't let me, and I thought the publisher was wrong. And so as I went and talked to audiences, I would make fun of the publisher. I had this book. It was going to be called Theology of Justice. The publisher ruined it. They called it Pursuing Justice. Don't you agree? And nobody ever agreed. And finally, my wife said to me, she says, Ken, don't you understand? Nobody thinks the phrase Theology of Justice is cool. You do. <clears throat> Um, and so it's remarkable that this principle, this idea that we were going to embed at the center of the conference, in many respects, is I think why the conference has found a footing and, and put down roots and grown. And so what is this theology of justice? It's simply this, that an understanding of God should drive and compel our love of others, that an understanding of God should drive and compel our love of others, and that our love of others would therefore inform our knowledge of God. Let me go a little deeper into this. We get into the problem of thinking that justice is simply just actions or ethics out there, things that we do, programs that we have. But there's another component to justice that is incredibly important to understand and that it's, that it's got a theological component, meaning that, that somehow we come to know God more through the study and interaction with justice. Theology is two Greek words, theos and logos, just like biology, which is bi uh, bios and, and logos, uh, the study of life. Theology is the study of God. And so it's how we know God, how we know things about God, how we come closer to God in our relationship with him or our intimacy with him. That's what theology means. So a theology of justice is simply saying, how can we know God more or what can we know about God that we otherwise wouldn't know if we didn't reflect on or study justice? You see, we can know God through his creation. You look at the stars, Psalm 19, um, the heavens, declare the glory of the Lord. Night after night, they pour forth speech. In other words, creation speaks to or informs our knowledge of the creator. You look at a painting, you know something about the painter. We understand that. When you look at creation, it speaks to your knowledge of God. Justice is the same thing. That somehow when we look at justice, it informs our knowledge of God. If you want to know me, if you really, you, you it, I'm not really worth knowing, but if you wanted to know me, if you wanted to get close to me, if you really wanted to have a deep friendship, at some point you would have to know that I have four daughters. 
and that these four daughters are the love of my life. And if you don't know how much I love my family and my four daughters, your knowledge of me will remain deficient. But once you understand what is in my heart and that, that, that I live for my children, that I would easily, quickly give up my life to spare my children harm, right? That if you understand that, you begin to understand me more fully. Jesus says the same thing in Matthew 25. He says, if you help the poor and the needy, if you, if you, if you feed the hungry, if you clothe the naked, if you visit those that are in prison, if you do these things to the vulnerable, you're somehow doing it to me. Why? Because I am intimately connected with those who I love. And what you do for them, you also do for me. No separation, no distinction. If uh, you look at Jeremiah chapter 22, this fascinating passage where God is judging a bad king. And, and we read this. For this is what the Lord says about Shalom, son of Josiah, who was a good king, by the way. Shalom succeeded his father as king of Judah, but he's gone from this place. He will never return. He will die in the place where they have led him captive. He will not see that land again. Woe to him who builds his palace by unrighteousness, his upper rooms by injustice, making his own people work for nothing, not paying them for their labor, workers' rights, slave labor, etc. He says, I will build myself a great palace with spacious upper rooms. And so he makes large windows in it. He panels it with cedar and he decorates it in red. The opposite of justice is consumerism. Does it make you a king to have more and more cedar? Did not your father, King Josiah, did not your father do what was right and just and so all went well with him. You see, that's when we give our lives away, we do it on the proposition that God has promised he'll take care of us. The just will live by faith. You see, and, and, and God's faithfulness is a derivative thing. We don't understand this usually in the church, that we first have to put our faith in something to then see that it's gonna be faithful. We have to trust that something will hold us up before we can experience that it's trustworthy. When we give our, our, our lives away, we're living by faith, and then God demonstrates his faithfulness. Do you see that? So God asks, your father did what was right and just, and so all went well with him. He defended the cause of the poor and needy, and so all went well. And then God provocatively asks this question, is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord. You see, justice isn't just about doing good things. Justice speaks to our very understanding or knowledge of God. There's a theology, there's a, a theological component to justice. Such that when we do it, God says, there it is, there you go, that's what it means to know me. Isaiah 58, much the same if I read it quickly and, and drive the translator crazy. It says, shout it aloud, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet, declare it to my people, for day after day they seek me, they want intimacy, they seem eager to know my ways, as if, there were a, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near to them. Again, intimacy. We have fasted, they say, and you have not seen it. Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please, and you exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I've chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is this what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, rather, to loose the chains of injustice and to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked to clothe them and not turn away from your own flesh and blood, then your light will break forth like the dawn 
and your healing will uh, quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard, your protection. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. If we want intimacy with God, if we want to grow spiritually, if we want to get in small groups at church, if we want to go to book clubs and find God, we can't just read books about crying out for God. We need to read books on justice so that we can truly move forward and come to be close with God. Where he is, doing the things that he cares about and reflecting what's in his heart. You see, we talk about a theology of justice. It's kind of at the beginning of what we were doing with the conference because if we don't talk about a theology of justice, one of two things will happen. We'll take and think too highly of ourselves and justice will become a cause for us, a way of branding our, ourselves, a way of getting on Facebook and defining ourselves to other people. And justice will, if we're not careful, become more about being heroic than it will be about faithfulness. Justice will become more about being heroic than about being faithful. And you see, it's not just that we do justice. What God wants for us is that we would become just. Does that make sense? The other extreme is to think too little of ourselves. One is to think too much of ourselves. The other is to think too little of ourselves. And I run into this all the time right now. People become fatalistic. Why help Syrian refugees? There's just too many of them. Why try and change the world? It just seems like injustice is ubiquitous. It's intractable. And so we become fatalistic. And there's a, 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 a real problem there because just because we can't fix the world doesn't mean we can't change the world. Just because we can't fix the world doesn't mean we can't change the world. And so we move forward trusting collaborating, creating, conspiring with a small group of other people, believing that a small group of, of people, like Margaret Mead once said, can change the world because I don't think the world has ever changed any other way than by a small group of committed people. And so I, I believe in Holland, as I believe in Hong Kong, as I believe in the United States, that God is looking for a few people idealistic enough to believe that we can change the world. Because if he didn't want us to change the world, he wouldn't have told us to try. And so let me leave you with this quote um, that I wrote one time just simply saying this. We never worship justice. We worship God. But the question is, can we worship God without justice? Thank you.